back. Let's see if this works. Hey, it looks like that's working. <clears throat> okay. Let's see if I can make that look a little cooler. All right, <laughs> looks like people are getting back in here. I'm just gonna, I'm doing too many things at once here. All right, I'm gonna post this. I'll do that. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me while I, uh, here, I'm just going to put us back on the intro music while I...
<laughs> Woo, all right, well that was an exciting start to the live stream. You know, it's uh, that's the first time in 140 live stream that that's ever happened. I have no idea how I got into 360 mode. Every time I like make a stream, it just says, do you want to use the old settings? And I say, yes, I do. Who knows? Um, well, welcome everyone to the non-360 version of Mando Lessons Live. Great to see you all here. Seems like people are finding it. And if you're new here, my name is Baron Collins Hill. Would love to hear from you in the chat. Let me know if it's your first time. Uh, if it is, you picked an exciting one to jump into. The way these work is it's an hour of Q&A. So if you've got questions about anything music, mandolin, you want to hear a tune, anything like that, throw it in the chat. The, the more uh, conversational the chat is, the more I like it. So don't be shy, don't be bashful. Uh, get into it, meet some of the other great folks that we got in here. And now it's my turn to ask you a question. Can anyone remember what the tune it was we're supposed to do this week? <laughs> Uh, I did Liberty because that's what I was making a play along jam of. But I can't remember what was actually supposed to get played. So if somebody knows, keep me posted and I can do that and then we'll play it at the end of the hour as well. Who do we got? Oh, we got Fenario in the Timbers of Fenario. One of my favorite Grateful Dead songs. Um, we have Sheldon. We have Aaron. We have Alan. Oh, that's a lot of N's. Sheldon, Aaron, Allen, Jane, Joe, Julia. Oh, sorry, Julie. Jeffrey. A lot of J. James. <laughs> Ryan, Keith. Mr. Cough Drop. Good to see ya. Uh, Ursinos, Neil, Wayne, Sherry, Woody, Joe. I'm repeating myself. Lewis, Loco. Joe, uh, yeah, you get the idea. Oh, Jamie Allen, thank you. Yeah, that's the one. All right, we'll do that in a second. Uh, let me just make sure I didn't catch anything. Seems like we got some weather reports coming in. It's been cold here in Oregon. It's currently 41, but it's been been waking up and it's been almost freezing every day. Do 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 do. Hey, I know. I I, I miss being. Julie says. Uh, miss seeing you play live, but loving the channel. Glad you're enjoying the channel. I miss playing live over there. Um, hope to... I do, okay, so here's a little recent news. I will be in, not Midcoast, Maine. I probably will be sometime next summer. Um, but June, what is it, 18th, 24th, 2023, I will be in Northeast Vermont. Uh, or Northern Vermont um, at the Northeast Heritage Music Camp. If you look up that, you'll find all the information. I'll be teaching mandolin there June 18th to 24th. Pretty small camp. Would love to pack it full of as many mandolin players as possible. I'll, of course, be telling you all about this off and on for the next couple months. But uh, get in while you can. I think it's, it's usually a pretty small, like under 100. I don't know. That, <laughs> I'm used to main fiddle camp, which is usually like a couple hundred people. So if it's like 80 or 100, that just it seems smaller. And I'm... Excited to uh, check out a new camp that I've heard great things about for so long. And there's a killer lineup of instructors, and I bet the campers are great too. Alright, let's see. <laughs> this looks more promising. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a new one. Technology never ceases to amaze. Woo! Fenario says it's 34 centigrade. That is hot. I think. It's too hot for me. What is that, like in the 90s? 34 C. Yep, 93. My conversion is still okay. It's not, not as good as it used to be. But uh, it used to be pretty good with the centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion. Alright. Wayne from Winnipeg. Octave Mandolin, yeah. Keep an eye out. They, they pop up every once in a while. If you can find a uh, one of those Eastmans. If you, if you find a good deal on that, that Eastman, what is it? MDO 305. 
I've played a bunch of those over the years, and they're they're great. And they've gotten a little more expensive. I used to be able to find them used for like 500 bucks, but that's, that would be a very good deal these days. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see. It is okay. Yep. It is Jamie Allen. Let's do a little bit of Jamie Allen as soon as I catch up. <laughs> Loco Joe. Yep. Yeah. David and I are in cahoots to get nobody. Just to make sure nobody gets any work done on Saturdays. Ooh, okay. Uh, and then I'll come back to Ersanos' question. Uh, any tips for developing a part B to a tune you've written? A part A for. Ooh, that's a good one. All right. I'll think about that while we play a little bit of Jamie Allen. back to that one at the end of the hour so Ursina says how any tips for developing a part b to a tune that you've written a part a for i think the thing that I, I i used to write a lot more tunes than i do now and usually for a long time i would just like rely on like pure inspiration of like oh, okay that's that's what happened didn't really think about it but yeah that what that does is it often ended up with me having a lot of parts like single parts of tunes that needed a B part. Um, I think one thing that can help is you can think about chords. Um, like something that can like give you a little spark is like maybe if the tune's going along. So what I did there was just made up a tune, but um, I won't be able to play it ever again because, well, I guess it's all recorded now. So if anyone wants to turn that into an actual tune and make a name for it, go for it. Uh, so yeah, like I was kind of playing something pretty standard in G. G, 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 a C and a D and a G, and I thought, okay, where am I going to go with this? So that's the, the part, what I thought was like, oh, something I can do to kind of keep along the same vein, you know, we're in the same key, same time signature, what can we do to differentiate the B part from the A part? Start on the C chord, so the four chord, so that's what, yeah, but dum, da dum, 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 B and then a G, it's a C. So maybe if you're stuck on a B part, maybe uh, make some chords for it first, and that'll give you a little bit of direction on what should happen next in terms of the melody. Do I play Irish bazooki? I do. I don't have one. My my bazooki dash citern is in the shop, getting a pickup installed. 
Um, but I, I do play uh, Irish bazooki and tenor guitar in Irish bazooki tuning. The Timbers of Trevelin, Ar Argentina. I'm probably not saying that name correctly, but cool. I would love to go to Argentina sometime. How do you prevent your elbow from cramping after playing for a couple hours? Uh, I think in the like, sort of... It's all about technique, really. Like, I spend a lot of time talking about technique on the channel because I spend a lot of time thinking about technique in my own playing because really, it's kind of the... I don't know it's it's like one of the most fundamental things it's not it's not you know it's not a fun sparkly exciting thing to think about and practice um and talk about but it really it it, it really kind of leads to all sorts of things so you know thinking about okay my my elbow's cramping up after a couple hours that means there's tension somewhere can i get that tension out and a lot of it is just learning to kind of troubleshoot your own playing you know chase the tension out of wherever it is in whatever part of your body because what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to be more comfortable and when you're more comfortable you're going to have more fun and it's going to when you're comfortable you can play for longer which is going to make you get better quicker because you have more stamina uh, it all kind of comes back to technique in my in my book um, so really you know thinking about technique going back to that beginner series that I have even if you're not a beginner and just really you know get that technique dialed right in and that'll help you not cramp up. Also, like doing some stretches, like you'll see me do this a lot. Um, whatever it may be that sort of is helpful for you um, to kind of stretch out, definitely helpful. All right, Shane from Alaska. And Roche, apologies if I don't have you saying your name. Uh, from Alabama, the Valley, Alabama. 25 Fahrenheit, where we are without wind chill. Ooh, that's a little chilly. Ooh, 12 degrees with the wind chill. You want to hear an Irish tune? I'm not even going to try to say that name, but... Uh, it says, wants to hear an Irish tune. Okay. Orgoro Campio by Coltito Desertizio. All right, an Irish tune. Yeah, there's a tune. Oh, I don't have a whole lot of information on that one. I know it as Mr. McLeod's, um, and I got it off of a Willie Kelly, Mike Rafferty record, one of my favorite records called The New Broom, which is also the name of a lovely hornpipe. 
But yeah, I like that tune, and I don't play it all that much. Okay, let's see. There's an Irish tune. Dr. Sandesh Doshi. Good to have you here. Am I going to Acadia Trad after that? I'm not going to make it to Acadia Trad, um, but people should definitely go, because I'm really excited that it's starting back up. It's a camp in Maine, it, like right outside of, I mean, it's in Bar Harbor, but it's at the College of the Atlantic campus. It's just like the most idyllic camp setting ever. Uh, super beautiful, right in Acadia National Park. Um, right on the rocky shores of Maine. Um, and it's awesome. And I taught there for a bunch of years, and then it, it shut down for a couple of years, and now they're bringing it back. So I wish them all good luck, and I hope to be back there someday myself. Uh, Alishan says, do you have a recommendation for a software that can turn a recording into notation? I don't. I've often thought about it. There may be the technology at this point. Um, maybe somebody in the chat knows, or maybe somebody on Mandolin Cafe. <sighs> yeah, it seems like we should have that technology. I don't know of any software at this point, but maybe there is. Um, I mean, it's hard, especially if you're, you know, I think probably for the software, like if you play a full-fledged recording with a guitar and a mandolin and a, you know, a drums and like all that sound, how is it going to pick out specific instruments and throw it into notation and kind of know what instrument is what? Um, it seems like if we can get to the moon, we should be able to do that. Yes, that's true. Uh, Fenario says there are MIDI pickups and software that do notation as you play. Um, oh, Christine says my friend runs that camp. Which what were we talking about? Acadia Trad? Or are we talking about uh, Northeast Heritage? Um, either way, good people run all of those. Uh, Joe says wanted to remind people. Oh yeah, Joe's got an awesome website, um, but. Uh, that kind of uh, coag <laughs> the word I'm coming up with is coagulates my sheet music. Um, that's not exactly the word. Um, but what is it? KEK -E graphics. The... Let me see if I can get this. KEK -E graphics. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it's YouTube doesn't like it when... <sighs> on Patreon, um, I know Joe posted it. I can't remember the exact thing. I could look it up, but I don't want to bore you all looking at my screen while I look for it. But there is a great... Uh, Joe's done some nice uh, organizing of this, the tunes that I have on the website on like a, a page unto itself. That's true. <laughs> uh, not every tune needs a B part. Shady Grove is an, a prime example. It's true. If some need C and D and E parts. You know, you think about like Kid on the Mountain. There's a five part tune. Irish Bazooki question. I got one this summer. Found the fingering on the G string counterintuitive, so I tuned it to A D A D and find it great. Why don't more people use this tuning? <coughs> some people do. I like. I'm gonna go get a bazooki tuned instrument okay oh i don't have a, the right pick i'll make do So this instrument, is tuned like a bazooki, G, D, A, D, and Julie is saying, it, making more sense to her with A, D, A, D, and so what that does is it definitely makes it 
it makes it more what's the word I'm looking for kind of yeah ADAD is just a little more kind of logical if you think in terms of like you only have two notes you get to use the same idea on these two these G and D or sorry A and D and these A and D it's got a little more kind of um, words are failing me today but so why don't people use it more I, well some people do I think I use G D A D because if I want to play in the key of G um, I can do that I had that low G uh, available to me so like you can't get this sort of sound uh, And I find that often I want to have that sort of like if you if you're in ADAD, you probably are going to be capoing. Well, I don't know. Maybe some people play straight. Um, uh, you know, if I was in ADAD, I would probably capo to the fifth fret and um, then play out of D shapes. But you're sort of forcing yourself into a higher register there. This is sort of the lowest G chord you can play. Capo at five, and you have. I just like the low G, um, and it's a little. It yeah, for me, it helped my brain. I still think of bazooki as a fairly kind of limited keyed instrument. Like you know, I mostly play in G and D, maybe E minor or A minor, and then anything else I'm gonna capo up. So if I'm gonna play an A. I'm gonna go capo two. Um, F. I'm gonna go capo three and play out of D shapes. But yeah, great question. I mean, I think the answer is a lot. Some people do use A D A D. I've got a friend who plays a little bazooki, and she's always tuning in A D A D. Yeah, Joe, definitely post um, post that link on Patreon or send me an email about it and I'll make a, like a public post on Patreon about it. So people who, even if you're not a patron, um, you, can, you can find that page. I'll make it a little easier. Oh, okay. Uh, Allison. Uh, oh yeah, I've always like kind of visualized an an H in in the oh there, there okay there is okay excellent good to know thank you Allison. <laughs> uh, one I saw mentioned software asked about is ScoreCloud, but was wondering if anyone had used it or something similar. Yeah, I've never played around with any of that stuff, but maybe somebody here would, or maybe somebody on the Discord or somebody on Mandolin Cafe. On the Irish tune, it looked like you were in second position on the E string. I was. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is I'm lazy and using bad technique. And the other one is because this is actually a mandola scale length. Um, I'm trying on a new lens that's a little easier to shift for larger instruments uh, so so yeah because it's a longer scale length that stretch is a little longer so <clears throat> I think they're like sometimes I think part of it is I'm just kind of lazy so I'll, I will go to that sort of like half position pointer on the third fret I don't, no that's not half position that's I guess that would be Second position or first and a half? I don't. I don't actually know the name. Of... Um, so yeah, part of it is just like the scale length is longer. Part of it's a little bit that I'm just lazy and kind of using 
improper technique. Part of it is also, like, when I want to get a, a, a double stop like that, doing that, like, you can do it. I see people doing it, but that stretch for me is hard on, on even, like, a regular mandolin scale length. Oh, nice. Uh, so Christine says the Northeast Heritage. Very cool. Yeah, I look. I look forward to meeting that whole crew. And I know. I know some of them already. I've been talking to a couple, <coughs> a couple folks there, and I, I know them. Um, ah, for recording indiv individual instruments. Yeah, I think you know, like the kind of the MIDI setup, or maybe there's a, a program that'll just do it at this point. I don't know. Hey, Betsy, you are at another virtual meeting. Well, you missed the, the excitement of the day, which was, some for some reason, <laughs> the live stream started itself in 360 degree mode, so everything was really weird looking, and I had to restart it. So you didn't, you didn't miss too much. You missed the excitement, I guess. Can you talk about the best way to humidify a mandolin in a hard case uh, and what the humidity should be? I'm not an expert on that. Um... There, there's a little like blue Daddario thing that you can like strap into the side. I'm not a huge fan of like the dampet, the green snake that you like put in the instrument because I've seen those leak and it's in your instrument and if it gets wet in there, it just seems like a bad, bad thing. Um, but some people use them and swear by them. Um, so yeah, I like kind of separate things that are not on the instrument and. Yeah, I had a blue one from Daddario for a while. I can't remember what it's called. They also make like the humidity packs. I don't, um, I don't know a whole lot. I because I'm in Oregon, the I'm kind of out of the practice. When I was in Maine, I would just humidify the whole house um, because it, it when it gets in like below freezing forever, all the moisture leaves the air, and you're either heating with a wood stove or you know pumping hot air through the house, and it dries things out really quick. In general, the way I see it is, like, if humans are happy, instruments are probably going to be happy. Um, you know, you, you want to avoid extreme changes in temperature or humidity, things like that. Um, and I, in terms of, like, what the humidity level should be, I don't know, 60%, 50%, somewhere in there. I think, you know, a, a pretty wide range. Others probably have a lot more. I'm a little lax on that kind of stuff, and I haven't run into too many problems myself. Um, but there's probably a, a, a better authority on the subject than me. Oh, Toku Lover 89 says, can I play the, these reels? Uh, the stone in the field, the steeplechase, the Kulfada reel. I don't, I, I feel like I've played the stone in the field, but that's the only one that I recognize the name of. I mean, I, I recognize the steeplechase, but I, I can't play it off the top of my head. Unfortunately, yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to pull those out, but it sounds like a nice set. Oh, Guitar Pro. Oh yeah, Guitar Pro, uh, I've heard of that, I've never used it. I use MuseScore for writing out tunes. It's a free open source program. Uh, do I know Elzik's Farewell? I can follow it, I don't know how to start it. Um, wish I did. I, I played it recently with somebody. Um, but I can't, I can't pull it out. Uh, <laughs> like those. Just gonna count. I love that the chat is running right along. I love it when I can't keep up. Uh, ooh, nice. Swampy, Swampykin says, just picked up a Weber Bitterroot with the winter rolling in. Do you have any good practice on preventing humidity issues with more expensive instruments? Uh, I just kind of addressed a little bit of that, but yeah, like, you know, keep, if, if people are happy, instruments are usually happy. Um, you can get a little in the, in the pocket, uh, like D'Addario, Humidipack, or the little blue bottle thing. Oh, 
Venari says, I tried to transfer all this knowledge to an archtop tuned in Dadgad. So I guess D-G-A-D for me, kind of. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, Dadgad and G-Dad are very, like, similar, but they're just in different order. Um, okay, it's the fourths instead of fifths thing. Nice. Oh, cool. Uh, people should look up Ursinos' uh, SoundCloud, and I'll, I'll go check those out at some point. And remind me in the Discord, too, because I'm going to forget. Rick from Michigan, good to have you here. Oh, yeah, John Coyne was on uh, Sharon's stream last week. I didn't go to it, but... Uh, Oh, cool. Nice. He was playing an ADAD. That's fun. All right. I think I'm catching up here. Boveda humidity packs work well. Cool. I've not heard of those, but yeah, I'm sure other people know a lot more about humidity than I do. All right. I'll play a tune. Was somebody, was, I couldn't, I can't, I can't play that set, but was there another request? I can't remember. Anyway, I'll play something, and if you got requests or more, que more questions, throw them out there. tune major or minor that is a tune called polska from morco swedish tune elzik's farewell i wish i could pull it out but i only follow along on that one crooked stovepipe i'll play a little crooked stovepipe loco joe good to see you have fun uh, have fun with those transcriptions oh yeah planksty is the best love planksty neil uh, yeah, so that tune is called Polska, P-O-L-S-K-A, Fran, F-R-A-N, uh, Morco, M-O-R-K-O, is the umlauts. Um, all right, yeah, Crooked Stovepipe. I think I can remember how that goes. <laughs>
<laughs> kind of a wild and woolly version of Crooked Stovepipe. I love that tune, one of my favorite ones. Love playing that tune with Benjamin Foss, who Lewis knows. All right. Are there any tunes you don't know if they're Irish or bluegrass just by hearing them? I'm interested in that Appalachian time period. That's a good question. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of opens up in my brain like a whole thing of kind of like, uh, the, these days, like in modern music, like I'm going to be able to pinpoint what something is, what it sounds like, you know, between... There's definitely stuff I can't, like, there's some kind of stuff between, like, Cape Breton and Scottish and a little bit into Irish that I can't always tell exactly what's going on there um, and, like, kind of which tradition it's pinpointed to. But between Irish and old time and bluegrass, also there's some, like, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Scandinavian stuff that I, I can't always figure out which is which. But the more you, uh, the more you listen and the more you learn the the more you're able to kind of figure out what you're listening to um but yeah there definitely is you know something to be said for the fact that you know bluegrass and old-time music all kind of you know started from uh irish and scottish immigrants coming over and settling down on the east southern east coast and then you get old-time music and there are tunes like um what's that one boys of blue hill and Twin Sisters. Boys of Blue Hill and Twin Sisters are pretty much the same tune. Uh, just one's Irish. No, uh... I'm getting them mixed up, but I've talked about that, I think, in the lesson. It's just sort of like how you, it's in both traditions. Or a tune like St. Anne's Reel, which I believe is originally a Quebec tune, but kind of has gone Irish, old-time, bluegrass, everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun little thing to, to puzzle through. A brief section on chords and fiddle tune lessons. That's a good idea. Um... Yeah, I, mean, I think part of the, the trick there is, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. I find chords to be so kind of like per, either particular to the tune or to who's playing it. Like there's no, like with a melody, I can say like here are the notes, but with chords, it's like, well, there's just, in my brain, there's so many options. And like if you want to play chop chords, that's great. If you want to play kind of Irishy sounding drowny chords, that's great. If you want to do kind of old timey strum guitar style chords, that's great. And then there's like, which chord do you use? Do you use the classic D chord, G and C? Or do you do... You know, more different inversions. It's just kind of a whole can of worms that I feel like if I tried to do that in a, a fiddle tune lesson, you'd be sitting there listening to me go down rabbit holes for another 20 minutes every <laughs> every lesson. Oh, yeah. Um, so Neil says, just saw the recordings of Owen Marshall and I. Owen's got an album that he said, he, I think the, the, the records are in the mail. Um, if you don't know Owen Marshall, he's an amazing musician on the East Coast. Plays a lot of dead Gad guitar and tenor banjo and kind of everything. Just everything with strings and frets. Um, the, what was the barn dance? Um, he, we did... A two, uh, like more of a reel that Bob, a Bob McQuillan uh, composition. Uh, but we did it in, he, Owen kind of turned it into a, like a slower tune. Uh, what I get? 
Multnomah, Multnomah March. Um, I can't remember. We did, uh, oh, oh, Lucy Fars. We did Lucy Fars. Um... <laughs> I can't remember the all the different sets that we did but um you can you can look them up i can't i can't remember i they, i think the, in the videos they say what the tunes are ah red-haired boy is a great tune bbc series called wayfaring stranger with phil cunningham he explores how music moved from scotland to ireland then america i've heard of that but i've never watched it i should add that to my list all right i also gotta head out here pretty soon so let's play a little bit of jamie allen um, and then pick another tune for next live stream. I don't know if that'll be next week or not. Um, but yeah, a little Jamie Allen and then... And then send you on your way. So, Jamie Allen, Kia G. Let's all play the melody. Play the melody and I'll play some harmony. should next week's tune be that's the next question while i enter the last couple questions thank you all for hanging out um yeah definitely watch that uh wayfaring stranger all right let's gonna add that to my list as well uh allison says when doing composition how do you decide on the key i know sometimes you can just look at what notes are natural flat sharp but sometimes that is not helpful uh do you mean like when writing a tune or like trying to figure out what key a tune is in that you're reading. I'll just answer both, I guess. Um, with composition, if, you're, if I'm like writing a tune and trying to figure out what key it's in um, or what key it should be in, it's usually just like what falls naturally underneath my fingers. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of built in comfort of like, you know, why are all these Irish tunes in D and G and A and E minor and A minor? Um, it's because they, they kind of make sense on the instrument. Um, so I'd say, you know, compose for the 
the instrument that you are either are playing on or want to be playing on, you know, so, um, and, and for, sort of for the style, if you want to write a really straight ahead Irish tune, um, for a bunch of fiddle players and, you know, classic Irish instrumentation, writing one in like C sharp probably is not going to be a great way to get a bunch of people to play it because that's not a common key. Um, but some people will, will, will love playing in C sharp. I wish I could play better in C sharp. Um, okay. It does seem like you were saying when writing a tune. Yeah. So that's sort of, that's how I go about it is like, you know, think about what instrument is going to be, what, what instrument you either are composing it on or what instrument you imagine being played. Um, let's see. Jim Ward's. Oh, I, I love that tune. Is it on my website? Let me look into my handy dandy notes. Handy dandy notebook. What is that? Blue? Is that Blues Clues? Handy dandy notebook? Um, <laughs> haven't thought about that in a while. What did you say? Jim Ward's. Jimmy Ward's. Hey, we've never done it. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, Jim Ward's, Jimmy Ward's, however you want to say it. Um, let's do that one. A great jig. I think in G, is that? I think that's it, but <laughs> trust the in, trust the internet and my website, not my live stream brain. Um, great suggestion. Jim Ward's next time. Ooh, Danny Boy. Also good. Uh, what is that also called? London Derriere. We also have not done that one. Maybe we should do that one soon. What are the string gauges on your instrument? On this one or on a general instrument? Like on a regular mandolin, uh, I use EJ75s. Where am I here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's... Mandolin Inception. Um, EJ75s on a regular mandolin, which is like their medium heavy gauge. If it's not a modern built instrument and it seems too kind of lightly built for those, I just use EJ74s or 3s, which are medium and light respectively. On this instrument, I'm using EJ67s, which is the mandola set. It's their like medium heavy mandola set with a high that the E string is a nine and a half, just like I buy nine and a half single loop ends. Um, and that's as, that's as heavy as I can get away with on this instrument. Um, so yeah, mandola strings with a, a single nine and a half. I buy nine and a half singles and then add them to the set. Um, but they also make, the dairy also makes a EJ72, I think, which is like the light gauge mandola. Okay, the one I'm playing, yeah. So EJ76, what is it? It's I'm gonna guess, I think it's 53, 34, 23, or 24. Ooh, uh, 15, 16, <laughs> nine and a half. That's, that's total guessing. Um, I can just tell you. Uh, EJ76 strings are. How well did I do? 52, pretty close. 35, close. 25, close. I was pretty close. So yeah, 52, 35, 25, 15, and then nine and a half for the high E. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for hanging out, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, don't put the mandolin down just because the live streams are over. Keep on playing. It's a good opportunity to procrastinate and have a nice chill Saturday. Hope you all have a great rest of your weekend and see you all soon. Bye-bye.